Thank you all uh, for giving me a chance to tell you a bit today about what we're doing at St. Lucie Reef. Uh, this has been a project that um, was spurred on by Jeff Beal arriving at Harbor Branch. He actually occupies an office over on the other side of Old Dixie Highway, even though he works for FWC. Uh, when he got here, he knew that I was working on coral health in various different areas and said, you have to see this site. And I told him, you mean there's corals there? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, they're not supposed to be. He said, I know, but they are. So that spurred us on to start looking at this area. And it's just outside of St. Lucie Inlet, just south of it a little bit. Um, so this is a really interesting area. It's f much farther north than the thermal tolerances of most corals along the eastern seaboard in the US. In fact, for about 24 species of corals, they're found to this inlet and not any farther. There's a few species that are found north of this inlet, about three or four. Most of those are things like Oculina and Cladocora, small, bushy, uh, encrusting corals. So this is kind of a, a threshold for many of the corals that are in the South Florida region. There's been a number of people that have worked on this project. Uh, thank you to all for your help. You're a great team. And the Park Service in particular, uh, this is part of a state, a state park, the St. Lucie Inlet State Park, was really instrumental in, in helping us to think about how to make the data that we're collecting useful in terms of regulatory management moving forward. And Charles Jabalay at the park has really been instrumental with that. So we're right now experiencing a release, and they make release decisions in a very simple model here. <laughs> right now we're experiencing a release of about 250 cubic feet per second. If you look at this chart here on the right hand side, you'll notice that the maximum allowable releases can be upwards of you know, 3,000 to 7,000 cubic feet per second at any given time. So this is a very moderate release that we're experiencing right now. It can be huge flushes at certain times. And so you see these pulses of uh, turbidity-laden fresh water extending out of the inlet and extending out and over the reef. Now in most inlets in Florida, as the water comes out of an inlet, it turns south and flushes along whatever is present. So it's coming right out and across the, uh, the sites that we've established at St. Lucie Reef. And so the major question is, when we go out there and the water looks like this, I'm there, believe it or not, because of these heavy discharges, how is it impacting coral health in this region? And we've selected two species, Deplore clavosa, a common brain coral, and Montastria cavernosa, the greater star coral. These are the most dominant corals on this reef, and this is not a reef that's built up by lots of accumulation of corals over time. Instead, it's a relict reef that has a veneer of corals that are encrusting it across the top of it. So most of them look like huge saucers that are attached to the bottom in this high wave environment. And we're looking at three main things to quantify health of these corals. Their gene expression, what genes they're turning on in response to the stimuli that are present. The bacterial communities that are on their surface mucus. So the same way we have bacteria that contribute to our health status, they have bacteria that contribute to their health status. And then the zooxanthellae are the small algae that live within corals and allow them to do photosynthesis and survive in areas where they may otherwise not by feeding alone. So in 2010, working with Jeff, we established three sites that we called North, Central, and South. We added the ledge site in 2011 because we saw some interesting things going on there in terms of uh, fisheries use at that ledge site. That's where you see big goliath groupers come in during cold snaps. It's where you see huge schools of tarpon over the top of the reef. And so we wanted to tie some of the work we were doing to data that was being collected by other parts of FWC. In 2011, we installed the little pendant hobos, like Annie just showed you, that can collect temperature and light data. They work wonderfully. In 2012, we installed some salinity uh, probes that I'll talk about in just a moment. And essentially, we've been targeting at least two sampling events a year, correlating roughly with wet season and dry season. But when we can add more than that, we do. Ideally, we'd be doing it quarterly, but this is a fairly rough place to work. The only boats we have access to are up to about 22 feet. So when it gets rougher than about three foot seas, we can't get out there. And it's more common than you would expect for this site. At each of these sites, we have five colonies of each of those corals. With the exception of the north site, there are no Montastria cavernosa at that north site, only the brain coral, Deploria. 
So these onset salinity meters, they're called U24s. Initially, they were marketed as a really cost-effective tool to monitor salinity in ocean environments and in raceways and everything else. Up until this point, most salinity meters that could be deployed for a given amount of time were in the $5,000 range. This one came along, it was 600 bucks. We snapped up 10 of them and said, let's give this a shot. Quickly found out there were some problems. Number one, you can't calibrate them. You take endpoint measurements in situ of the salinity and you use that to fit your curve. If there's any drift or variance in between those two endpoints, you don't capture it very well. Also, they were supposed to last three years sampling once every minute. We set them to sample every 15 minutes. They lasted five months and nine out of 10 of them died. We've had serious biofouling issues and most sensors like YSI sensors, for example, uh, YSI is a company that makes sensors, make anti-biofouling kits that you can install on your sensors. If you install those kits on these sensors, it impedes their ability to be accurate. So you're stuck with a sensor that is likely gonna fail on you pretty soon, uh, gets biofouled very easily and doesn't generate all that accurate data when it does get biofouled. So uh, I tasked uh, my technician, Mo, with looking at a number of different measures of how well these were performing. We installed them next to the Lobos out here in the, in the canal to see how they compare to a much higher end instrument. And what you see is that the Lobos, the one in yellow, most of them tracked fairly well within their specified 3% tolerance range. But one of them failed completely, couldn't even get it deployed. Three of the nine that were deployed didn't work very well at all. So my take home message for this is no, no to hobos. <laughs> We've also looked at bacterial community profiles. Each of these individual dots represents the entire bacterial community that's on a given coral. So dots that are very close to one another have similar bacterial communities. Dots that are far away from one another have very dissimilar bacterial communities. And what we found is that over time, there's a lot of change, but there's no differences among the sites that we were looking at. What's also interesting is that the bacteria that we're seeing at St. Lucie Reef are very different from the bacteria that live on corals in other parts of the Caribbean. So it's a unique location. When we look at the gene expression profiles, it seems that site rather than time seems to make more difference. We've seen things like elevated metabolism, tissue repair, and et cetera, during the summertime when it's hot, but at the south site, the site furthest away from the inlet, not the ones that are near the inlet, which is not what we expected. And this is from 2010. We're now processing the 2011, 2012 data. We've also been looking at those zooxanthellae. Take home message here, there's not a lot of difference over time or among site, but the two species have very different amounts of zooxanthellae within their tissues. And one of my grad students, Courtney Claypack, is going to be looking at whether or not these, these zooxanthellae are actually shifting because we know different zooxanthellae have different physiological capabilities. So we'll see which ones are present and if they change over time. The reason this work is really important is that it's setting a baseline for all these projects that are related to the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Here's a number of projects that are going on in this region. And it's not by accident that this map that they developed doesn't even show St. Lucie Inlet. Their entire scope of work is focused on the inlet and inward. They have no work going on whatsoever outside of the inlet. So by doing this project, we're hoping to fill a gap to understand how changes to this watershed are going to impact corals that are just offshore. A few numbers to leave you with. We've done some presentations at various different places. We have two publications, one that is ready to be submitted, one that's almost ready to be submitted, supported a number of students. We've been able to leverage a lot of various support. And right now we're working on a Florida Sea Grant proposal to expand this to not just do correlative work, where we look at how the water outflow affects the corals in the field, but to actually test the effects of the estuarine discharge water on corals using mesocosms. So that's our next step. Thank you.